Good morning, everybody. Pastor Mike here with another Watchman Pure Bible Study, the book of Galatians, chapter 4. We're going to pick up what we were talking about a couple weeks ago for the last two Bible studies on being a son of God, being joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Let's look at Galatians 4, and then we're going to talk about uh, what I mentioned last week, we're going to talk about Saul and Solomon, uh, the two S guys, all right? Um, Galatians chapter 4, verse 1, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now what you're going to see in Second uh, Chronicle or Second Samuel chapter let's see, where is it? Second Samuel chapter seven, what you're going to see is God adopting Solomon, all right? that we might receive the adoption of sons, and because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Now, we covered a lot of different issues, um, but let's look at this thing that God promised to David. David had already become king. We're in 2 Samuel. And I had mentioned to you last week for you to study 2 Samuel 7, uh, Psalm 89, and so forth, and then look at Saul's life. I mean, we know what Solomon did, and we covered that last week. Saul had a thousand wives, 700, well, 700 wives here in the concubines. He had a thousand women. He had all the money, he had chariots, he had music, he had, he had worldwide fame. He had everything that every man could want, and he sinned a great deal because with all these wives, he was building pagan temples to them. He was actually participating in the religion. So he was a man of many religions, but, and we're going to see this in the Bible, God allowed him to retain his wisdom throughout all this. So at the end of his life, he writes the book of Ecclesiastes, and he says, it's vanity, okay? And now you and I know that. We don't have to experience everything that Solomon experienced. We don't have to have everything in the world. We don't have to have all the women, all the money, all the wine, all the, all the power, all the religious instruction. We don't have to have that. Some may still want that. But the truth of it is Solomon regretted it severely at the end of his life. It was very very, if you compare the book of Proverbs and the Song of Solomon and you see this attitude, this good spirit in Solomon, you compare that to Ecclesiastes, you see a very broken man. You see a different writer almost, all right? So the advice that Solomon gives to all of us is don't even try it. If you can't handle this much pain, at the end of your life, if you can't take this much regret at the end of your life, don't try it. So we have all of the sins that Solomon committed. And there was a bunch of them. We only are aware of one sin that Saul committed. So, in fact, let me read 2 Samuel so you know where we're going. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. He's adopting him right here. Then he said, If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. Again, the, the depth 
of this statement here. Just, I mean, it just got me one day. Here, here we have all of these sins Solomon committed. God forgave every one of them. We have one sin that Saul committed and God refused to forgive him. God just said, I'm not forgiving you ever again. I will not have mercy on you any longer. Okay, so what great, big, terrible, nasty, evil, dirty thing did Saul do? What, what sin did he commit? All right, um, let's go as a backup now, as a double witness to what God was telling uh, David in 2 Samuel 7. Let's go to Psalm 89. Because you're going to see it's very, very similar in what it says and how it says it. It basically says, I'll be his father, he'll be my son. I'll not take my mercy away from him, my covenant. I'll keep my covenant with him forever. Psalm 89, verse 20. I have found David my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. With whom my hand shall be established, mine arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate me or that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forever. And my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless... My loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. That is exactly what he said here in 2 Samuel 7. It's almost like David, upon hearing this, then wrote a song, Psalm 89, to match what he had heard from God. Um, verse 34, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven, Selah. Now, while I'm thinking about this, for those of you who struggle with, does God still love me? Uh, even though, you know, the, the full um, bondage of sin, he has not broken in my life. Uh, I keep doing the same things over and over. I keep asking God's forgiveness. Will God stop forgiving me? Um, has God walked away from me? Is God going to forsake his covenant to me? And so on and so on. If, if God has designated you by uh, giving you the spirit of his son, crying, Abba, Father, if God has designated you as his son, then he will not stop having mercy on you. Period. He will not stop having mercy on you. Now, there's a difference between some church or some preacher or some person telling you you're saved and God telling you you're saved because there's been a lot of people who was told by a church or a preacher or an altar worker of some kind or anybody oh you prayed oh you're saved okay they may not be they may not truly be born again and have the spirit of God's son crying Abba Father okay uh, we'll let God worry about who that is 
Okay, I'm not to look and point fingers and say, well, I can tell they're not saved. I can tell they're not saved and I don't think they're saved. They're not saved like me. That is not my place. My place is to take what I'm learning from the Word of God and apply it to me to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. It is my responsibility to examine the Scriptures and let God tell me whether I'm saved or not. Because so many people told that they're saved by a church or by a preacher or an evangelist or uh, you know someone visiting their home or whatever, and then telling them, well, no, it, you know, it doesn't matter what you do after this, you'll still go to heaven. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about anything. Okay, God's got everything covered. There's this. Um, I was informed there's this new ideology. Of course, there's nothing new under the sun, but I've never heard of it before. But apparently, some some guys, some preachers, uh, one of which I know, is into this bold faith movement or some kind of new grace movement. And it espouses adultery and drunkenness. And, you know, it's all covered under grace. Don't worry about it. You can do these things. In fact, it's probably better to go ahead and sleep with this woman you, you wanted, you're lusting after once. Get it over with. Get it out of your system so it doesn't ruin your marriage. You know, rather than just, a, you know, lust after her and, and continue on. And I'm just going, what? And these people are believing it because... A church or a denomination or a minister or somebody has told them, oh, you can do these things and still be saved. Okay? And it's without any retribution from God whatsoever. Now, God's very clear on this issue. As a saved, born again, you have the Spirit of God, God's Son in you. You are God's Son. And if you think... You can go out and sin and do whatever you want to. God's got a rod waiting for you when you get back home. And he's going to take it to you. And he's going to, I mean, he is going to, I used to have a teacher. I'm going to burn your bottom real good, Michael Hoggard. Okay? Whew. And he did. God will, God's going to burn you. He's going to take a rod after you. He's going to whoop on you and beat on you in your life until you can't stand it, until you come around and say, I can't do those things anymore. That is a son of God. Okay? So, take these things and ask yourself, am I saved? All right? Um, now, so we have the double witness here, Psalm 89. God saying, I will, he will be my son, I will be his father. Um, I, I will never take my mercy away from him. I'll never break my covenant with him. If he sins, I'll take a rod after him and make him wish he had never done that, ever. But I will not take my mercy and my loving kindness away from him. The chastening of God is the evidence that you are truly born again because you receive that chastening and you know it's God loving you and God correcting you and you want it. There'll be times when you'll say, God, I think I probably need a whipping for that. Okay? You be honest before God. Say, God, you need to chasten me. You need to chastise me over that. God, do not let me get away with those things. Okay? That's the, that's the sign of an honest, truly born again Christian. All right. Now, as far as Saul, why did God take his mercy away from Saul? Why did he do that? So, let's start out with the beginning of Saul's becoming king. We go to 1 Samuel chapter 10. And for time's sake, I'm not going to get into the whole story about the missing donkeys and how Samuel found him or whatever. Needless to say, Samuel anointed him. He found him. God said, this is the man. And Samuel anointed him. So, after this, let's see what God said. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. The Spirit of the Lord. I just preached this last Sunday. The Spirit of the Lord and this book go hand in hand. So, 
Now Saul, I mean, this is the very beginning. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon him and he's prophesying. He is saying, this is thus saith the Lord. And he's doing, doing it with the prophets. And everybody's going, is Saul among the prophets? What in the world's going on here? Boy, that man's, boy, he's something. He's different. Okay, he, God turned him into another man. Verse 9, same chapter. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. Whew. Started out well, didn't he? And all those signs came to pass that day. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. And the Spirit of God came upon him. And he prophesied among them. And it came to pass when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, What is this that is come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul among the prophets? These guys are going, Yeah, we knew Saul. He wasn't a preacher, we can tell you that. And now listen to him. I mean, he's preaching. Boy, listen to him prophesy. He's good. All right? So it's all real nice and good. And it, See, you can take this idea and apply it to the church you used to go to. That when it started out, boy, they preached the Bible, didn't they? Preached it good and straight. They used an old King James Bible, weren't they? Or a denomination or a ministry that you followed for years. And you saw the decline. Oh, they started out good. Oh, wow. Boy, I mean, they just started out great. Yippee. And then over time, you saw the decline in them. Or let's say you saw this in a person, maybe somebody in your immediate family, maybe somebody in your extended family, a cousin or an aunt, uncle or whatever. And you saw them when they first started going to church and boy you thought man oh, boy good they're saved amen and they just start out brilliant a bible college a seminary a, a radio ministry a tv ministry or an internet ministry boy when they started they was started out really good i mean they was just giving the bible out and boy we was eating it up and boy was really being fed from it and then Boy, something happened, and I don't know what it was, but all of a sudden, man, it just just got to where we couldn't listen to them anymore. We, we stopped supporting them. We couldn't go to that church anymore. We stopped going to that Bible study, that Sunday school class. We couldn't sit in there anymore. I mean, when it started out, we was all using the same Bible, but then we just had to pull out because a, a turn had been taken. And now all of a sudden, it's like they don't even believe what the Bible says anymore. They're all the time changing it, saying this translation's better, or Dr. So and so said this, and and okay, you know what I'm talking about then. So whether it's a person's life that you know, or it's some sort of ministry, a church, a denomination, a, some sort of big money, big name ministry, boy, when they started out, boy, they were hot stuff, man. But now, can't even listen to him anymore. Right? So here's what happened with Saul. Here's what happened. That's 1 Samuel 10. Five chapters later. It doesn't take very long. A couple years, maybe. 1 Samuel 15, verse 22. God told Samuel, Samuel tells Saul this, and Samuel told Saul, I uh, forgot the whole story, but he told him, he said, you wait here until I get back, and then we'll proceed. He said, we're going to go kill this king and all of his people. God has long suffered with them, but God's going to kill them today, and he's going to use you to do it. And he wants everybody dead. He wants the king dead, wants all the people dead, all the cattle dead, everything has got to die in this particular city. Saul didn't do that. Saul killed most everybody. He saved the king. And then he took some of the sheep and took some of the goods that they had. And it's then, it, as you read this story, you'll see that Saul pretended like he didn't do anything wrong. 
He didn't really see his sin here. Samuel said, you didn't do what God told you to do. He said, I did what God told me to do. Absolutely I did it. See, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. When you blatantly sin and go against something that is plainly written in the Word of God and then justify your own sin, like, well, there's nothing wrong with what I did. I'm as good as Christian as anybody. Right? Now let's, let's look at it. First Samuel fifteen twenty two and Samuel said that the Lord is great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Which is better? Big sacrifice because that's what Saul did. Saul took some of the sheep. As soon as Samuel shows up, hurry up, get those on the altar, and he starts burning them. Okay. Oh, praise God, hallelujah. Okay, makes it look a real spiritual like. And Samuel said, God doesn't get near as much glory and honor out, out of a burning lamb as he does you obeying him. So he said, uh, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. So, and think about where Saul ended up. Right at the house of a woman that hath a familiar spirit. Endora, a witch. He went from Preaching and prophesying in the name of the Lord to asking a witch to bring up a dead spirit. Necromancy. Going after familiar spirits, which God said, my people don't do that. Okay? Now think about what's happening with people, what's happening in their churches, what's happening in these big ministries. There is a subtle form of witchcraft. It is subtle enough is that a lot of people wouldn't recognize it, but the more they start emphasizing deeds and spoken words coming from people that you speak these words or you must speak these words or if we do this and if we perform this, then God will do that. And the more that we perform, the more God will do. When they start emphasizing that, that is a subtle form of witchcraft. We're saved by grace through faith. We are blessed by grace through faith. We have everything that God has given us as a free gift by grace through faith. And nothing, nothing that we have is by our works. Not one thing. It's all by grace or nothing is. So this is what he, this is what he turned to. Because thou hast, here we go, verse, verse 23, because thou hast rejected, look at this, look at your Bible, and underline this, the word of the Lord. You rejected the Bible, the word of the Lord is Jesus Christ, right? Rejected him. And rejected the word. I don't believe it. I'm going to disobey it because I think that God was wrong. That's what Saul did. Okay? Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. This is Saul's one sin. He rejected the word of the Lord. And God rejected him. Solomon, he did all kinds of stuff, didn't he? Even learned some new religious routines. But he still kept his faith and his trust in what God said. And we know, we know it. Um, where's my verses here? I don't think I have it here. But here's Solomon writing out portions of our Bible. Peter saying, Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God sig uh, signifying that Solomon was a holy man. Even though... He slept with all these women. 
and did all these religious practices and built their pagan temples for them and all of this stuff. Are you hearing me? Are you, are you listening to me, people, who go around and condemning everybody like they're not saved because they have a Christmas tree in their house? You go around condemning everybody because in your mind, Christmas is a pagan holiday and, and you'll not be soiled by having anything to do with Christmas. You know what? I'm fine with that. I really am. And I honor that in your life. But to look at everybody else and call them pagans and say that they're not honoring God and worshiping God the right way and they're probably not even saved because of it. Who do you think you are? Being everybody's judge. Solomon himself did far worse than having a Christmas tree in his house. He built pagan temples and offered incense in them, participated in their rituals blatantly, knowing, knowing that he was serving false gods, and yet God had mercy on him. What does that tell you? The stringing up of lights around somebody's house pales in comparison to the depths that Solomon sunk to in building these pagan temples and worshiping these false gods in them deliberately. And yet Solomon is in heaven. Saul, God took his mercy away from him. Look at this. Um, so after he rejected the word of the Lord, he was told this in verse 23, God took his mercy away from them and here's the evidence. Verse 24, and Saul said unto Samuel, sounds like Jimmy Swagger, I have sinned. <laughs> For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. This sounds good, doesn't it? Look at verse 26. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee. Thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. Period. It's done. God's not changing his mind. God does not change his word. He does not alter the things that comes out of his lips. If God said this, this is God, and this is what he does. You reject the word of the Lord at your own peril. And I'll just say this, these kind of people probably are not listening to me today, although you may. But there are people who, oh, we have nothing to do with Christmas. We have nothing to do with Easter. Those are pagan evil days. We worship Yahuwah and keep the Passover. Okay? Because that's what Yahuwah would want us to do had they had the New Testament been preserved in the original Hebrew, which never happened. And we don't trust that Greco-Roman paganized New Testament. It's not the New Testament. It's the renewed covenant. Going back to Sinai is what we're all about. They reject the whole New Testament. But they don't do Christmas. And they don't do Easter. And they don't have a Christmas tree. And they don't have lights. And they don't have this. And they don't do that. And they keep a, a Jewish traditionalized Passover Seder that just barely looks like something that they did out of the Bible, out of the book of Exodus. Just barely does it resemble the Passover that Moses kept. Okay? Just barely does. The rest of it, Jewish tradition from pagan sources. That's what Passover Seder is all about. And people gloat and brag and boast about all the stuff that they don't do and all the things that they do that they say honors and please God. I have short hair. I always wear long pants. Uh, my wife always wears a dress. 
uh, we don't watch television and we don't listen to radio and we don't do this and we don't do that. That's fine. Uh, that's great. Do you believe every word spoken to you in the King James Bible? Do you believe God's word? Or do you reject even a portion of it as not being true? Do you? Then God won't have mercy on you. And you can clean up everything you can on the outside and be rotten to the core on the inside. And God will no longer have mercy on you. You are not a son of God. Period. It's not. And I, I don't see any evidence that Saul became a son of God and then God had to kick him out and bastardized him. I don't see that. I see Solomon being designated even before he's born as a son of God and God never took his mercy away from him. Never did. So then, let's look at the evidence now. Here, toward the end of Solomon's life, he's writing Bible verses. Near the end of Saul's life, he is a miserable, demon-possessed wretch that hates even the sight and thought of David. 1 Samuel 16, 14, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. The Spirit of the Lord. No. Back in 1 Samuel 10, verse 6, the promise was the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee. And here, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Remember what the Spirit of the Lord is? It's this. So, God gave him this. Saul took it for a while and then started not believing what God said and rejected it. So, was it and I know the Bible says, but the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Okay, Who moved first? Was it God taking away his spirit from Saul? Or Saul rejecting it? It was Saul rejecting it. And God knew it. That's why he took his mercy away from Saul. See, salvation is all about grace through faith. Here's grace. And it's got to work through something in our life. And the only something that grace works through in our life is our faith in what God said. And if you have, if you really have God's Spirit of His Son crying, Abba, Father, in you, you will believe this book. You'll believe it. God's Spirit will cause you to believe it, will lead you into believing it. You'll, you'll, you'll not believe anything else. And you'll never walk away from it. Never, ever, ever, ever will you walk away from it. Um, so the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Okay? And then, let's, you know, we already know the story, but rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. The spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. How does it end up for Saul? For Samuel 28, now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and wizards out of the land. The Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Very important. Here's, here's Solomon. Near the end of his life, the Holy Ghost is giving him inspiration of the Word of God, and Solomon is writing it all down. The book of Ecclesiastes. Go read it. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy uh, Spirit. Um, or Holy Ghost. A whole, um, uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Um, we have a sure word of prophecy. What's the verse I'm trying to think of? Um, where it talks about the, the how God moved and how God worked in, in people's lives. Anyway, you get the idea. You get the gist of what I'm saying here. 
uh, Second Peter chapter one, I believe. I got to read it; it's going to bug me. I'll turn the camera off and then have to turn it back on and say, "Hey, I found what I was looking for." Second uh, Peter chapter one. Um, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I think that's what I was thinking of. But anyway, so here is uh, Solomon receiving the inspired word through him. God is giving it to him, and then Solomon is writing it down. But then you have Saul. And Saul prays to God, and God is silent. That sounds like the, uh, the uh, contemplative prayer people who swear that there are more profound things from God in his silence than there is when he speaks. I kid you not, is what they believe. They're hearing God in silence. So, God is silent to Saul, and he's not answering him by prophet. So, who was that speaking to Saul that was brought up as one of the gods out of the earth? It was not Samuel, because God won't speak to Saul by the prophets. He just won't. It was a familiar spirit. That's what Saul got turned over to the last religious act of Saul's life was witchcraft and divination and seeking a familiar spirit. What does that tell you? Lesbian, atheist, well, he's not a lesbian. Atheist witch. That's what Saul became. And God stopped forgiving him. He took his mercy away from him. And Saul ended up plunging his own sword into his chest. And yet Solomon honored throughout all the ages because God let him retain his wisdom and at the end of his life, God is still speaking to Solomon. Okay? So that, to me, that's the difference right there in salvation. Uh... You know, people then say, well, okay, so was Saul really saved or not? Um, I would have to say that salvation, that word, saved, salvation, belongs solely to those who are truly a son of God. That word salvation does not belong and is not designated toward those who go to hell. No matter how the road of life got them there, they went to hell. I do not see the word salvation being applied at all to those people. Okay? So, does that make me a Calvinist? Does it make me an Arminian? It just, I believe what God said in His Bible. And my understanding of it may be somewhat different than your understanding of it. But... Let God be true and every one of us a liar. So when you're in a place where you're not sure, ask God. Ask God. And then go to His Word and let God show you from His Word where you're going to spend eternity. Okay? God will show it to you. I promise you He will. God bless you. I love you. You're the reason why we do what we do. You keep us in your prayers always. All right? We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.